Today we're reviewing the Fantax Enthu Pro 2. This case, which is gargantuan, it's about $140 with the glass panel version 130 for steel, and Fantax is making a huge deal about this panel. So the front panel uses a, a, a fabric of sorts and goes a step beyond just being steel mesh. Today we're gonna be doing a lot of airflow testing on that front panel, but we also have a big section on radiator compatibility and of course overall build quality of this new full tower. Before that, this video is brought to you by Arctic Cooling and its Liquid Freezer 2 line. Arctic is actively restocking its Liquid Freezer 2 coolers that rank among the top performers for CPU coolers right now, including on Ryzen CPUs. The Liquid Freezer 2 series is focused on high thermal performance and value, featuring a blackout design and including a VRM fan mounted on top of the pump block to help provide airflow over neighboring VRM heat sinks. Arctic has also started selling its P12-120 case fans. Learn more at the links in the description below. This chassis is based on the existing Fantax P600S tooling, and it goes for a dual system optional approach, but also has a heavy water cooling focus. That said though, the way the power supply is laid out creates some interesting challenges, where you end up with a huge amount of space but as you'll hear in the build section of this review, it doesn't quite fill in as easily as it might with other case layouts. The case is intended to compete directly with some other large cases on the market. So for example, recently there's been the Fractal Defined 7 XL. There's been the Be Quiet series of cases like the Dark Base Pro 900. It's a bit older now, but there's Rev2 out there. It also obviously competes directly with the Lian Li 11 XL a 200-ish dollar case where you're paying a bit of an extra tax for that ROG logo, the unremovable one on the side of the glass. Uh, the Corsair Obsidian 1000D would probably be another one of note, but that is larger still than this. So the Enthu Pro, its big claim to fame is its fabric. It's high performance fabric, more specifically, and that's one of the things we'll be testing today. But at $140, it comes in lower than a lot of those competing cases, and it's able to do so by omitting fans. So this may be an option for people who are truly more water cooling inclined or who want to run with closed loop liquid coolers that include fans because you're dropping the cost out of the case immediately. That said, that makes this really difficult to review from a thermal standpoint and a noise standpoint because just like the Lian Li 11 XL, we have to sort of tweak how we do things since it doesn't come with fans and that is one of our main focuses for reviewing cases. So uh, we're going to talk about all that in a bit in the thermal section, but first let's get through the build notes and the build quality. Building in the Enthu Pro 2 got off to a rough start as no accessories were packed with the case. No screws, no zip ties, no hard drive cages, nothing. Luckily we have a full list of the items that are supposed to be included, including four modular three and a half inch hard drive brackets, a vertical GPU mount without the riser cable, and a dual system cover to be used when installing a secondary mini ITX board in the case. There's also supposed to be a GPU anti-sag bracket and various screws sorted into a plastic organizer. We can assume that this was just an oversight in an early review sample, but it's a good reminder to check accessories carefully to make sure everything was included. We've gotten reports lately of some CLCs coming without the proper mounting hardware, for example, and the companies will basically always send out the parts if you let them know. It's just inconvenient. In the list of missing parts, one omission was deliberate, case fans. Like the O11 Dynamic and the O11 XL, the Enthu Pro 2 does not come with any fans whatsoever. This is a decision that makes a little more sense in a case geared towards higher end liquid cooling setups as most CLCs come with their own fans and most open loop builders would prefer to simply supply their own. At least that's the common response we receive from our audience. For mid towers, we prefer to see a good set of stock fans included, but the Enthu Pro 2 is a different beast. This causes some difficulties for stock testing, but we'll get to that in the thermal section later on. Moving to the case itself, the Enthu Pro 2 is a bit of a monster. Fantex specifically states that this case supports 13 inch wide SSI EEB motherboards rather than using the more nebulous EATX naming. It's approximately as large as the Anodys AI Crystal that Intel sent us with the W3175X. And our assumption at the time was that they picked that case because it was large and the most affordable, but they didn't pick it for quality reasons. Back to the Enthu Pro 2. It's large, but there are some inconsistencies in how efficiently the space is used. Starting behind the motherboard tray, there are three main sections. Looking into the case from this side, the upper right is the motherboard tray itself, 
a relatively empty area with three two and a half inch drive sleds and about two and a half centimeters of clearance for cable routing. The bottom right is the power supply shroud area with the power supply oriented on its side so that the intake fan can pull air in through the side of the case. This design should allow more airflow to the power supply than a typical configuration, but the real purpose is to free up space in the interior of the case for reasons that we'll discuss in a moment. Since the shroud is entirely enclosed and only extends about two thirds of the length of the case, there's not really any more space inside than there would have been in a typical mid tower. The shroud is closed up with a hinged metal cable cover designed to take some stress off of the steel side panel. The cable cover is necessary, but we found it annoying to work with. Cables must be split into small groups to fit through the cutouts in the cover. Otherwise, the edges of the cover will bite into the cables and potentially cause damage to the cables. This problem was worse than it would usually be for our review system because we didn't connect any of the front panel USB cables and therefore had to route all of that cable clutter behind the cover as well. In trying to arrange cables around the cutouts and mash the cover down into place, it's easy to accidentally slide the cover off of its hinges and be forced to start over again. The cable cover can also be ignored completely, but if someone is having difficulty putting the cover on, then they probably need the cover. It's a frustrating experience having to carefully choose where to place cables in a case that's this gargantuan to begin with. It wouldn't be that big of a deal if it weren't so huge as it is now. Still, examining this side of the case, the left portion is dedicated to cable management and various mounting locations. The rails that run from top to bottom can be used for 120 mil fan thanks to a side intake vent cut into the side panel or for modular three and a half inch drive base. Or the plastic covers can just be left in place and used for mounting SSDs. Fantex has opted not to use the weird sliding guillotine covers here that we criticized in the P500A and the Enthu Evolve X, and that decision to exclude them is one we can appreciate. Instead, they've used pop-out plastic blanks similar in function to the ones included with the Dark Base Pro 900V2. These blanks have big plastic fins and cables can be routed through them. We'd argue that empty space is even easier to route cables through, and we'd ask that Fantex please chill out and stop making this more complicated than it needs to be. A better handled location for cable management is in the center of the case, where, again, like the P500A, there are extra large Velcro straps that loop over the hooks punched out of the case. These are great to work with, they cover a wide area, and they made it possible to spread our power cables out enough to fit under the cable management cover. Our one complaint with these straps is that one of them conflicts with one of the SSD sleds such that it's difficult to use the strap when an SSD is installed and plugged in. Moving then to the case interior, it becomes clear why Fantax has oriented the power supply shroud in such a strange way. And it's because the Mini ITX option mounts directly to the side of the power supply shroud this time. So unlike the other Fantax cases where you have to buy accessories to shove into the top of the case, in this one, in theory, if yours ships with the included accessories like they're supposed to, then you would just install it right there. It doesn't allow for a, a horizontally installed video card, so you would have to do a vertical mount and you would have to purchase the PCIe riser card separately. A couple of extra things to note here too. If you want two systems, you'll either need two power supplies, which you won't be able to fit two once you put the second system in there, or a power supply that can output and drive two systems. Fantex does sell one of those, it's called the Revolt X. Uh, alternatively, if you didn't do the mini ITX system, you could throw a power supply in right here, but then there's a couple of other things to consider. One is you need a way to reasonably bridge the two power supplies, and Fantex sells something for that too, go figure. Uh, and it's also kind of a weird use case unless you're going for some sort of almost server-like redundancy or something, but we haven't explored it. The other thing to consider is that it does potentially put the fan of the power supply pretty close to the glass, and likewise, if you're doing a mini ITX build with a vertical GPU, that fan's gonna be fairly close to the glass as well. So there are some airflow implications to consider there. And then finally, if you do neither the power supply nor the mini ITX build, in this spot, it leaves a little bit of extra room for potentially fans or radiators that don't take up as much width. The major negative consequence of rotating the power supply is that vertical space is bizarrely limited given the size of this case. The O11 Dynamic cases deal with this problem by moving the power supply behind the motherboard, but the Enthu Pro 2 must meet the full height of an ATX board and the full width of an ATX power supply and shroud into a body approximately 55 centimeters tall, minus the legs. 
That leaves whatever's left over for fans, radiators, and cables. There's only three centimeters of space between the top edge of the motherboard and the roof of the case, and about 1.5 centimeters from the bottom edge of the motherboard to the power supply shroud. Fan mounts at the top of the case are offset away from the motherboard to mitigate this problem, but it's a jarring limitation to hit in one of the largest cases we've reviewed. Routing CPU power cables and fan connections to the top edge of the board isn't any harder than it would be in a mid-tower, but it's a far cry from the huge wide open space above the motherboard in the O11 dynamic cases and even the Anity's AI crystal, which we don't particularly like. Fantex has left the front this space open in part because it does actually have a separately sold optical drive bay. Bizarrely, the optical drive bay mounts sideways, so you'd have to remove the glass in order to access it. So it does not mount against the front, where the front I.O. door, this door up here somewhere, everyone who works here thought that that door was a cover for a five and a quarter inch bay. It was the first thing that I thought was there when I saw it. I opened it and I was like, oh. Okay, there's no hole there, so it's not for an optical drive. So it doesn't replace that, but instead would eject out this way. And again, you would have to buy that separately. So uh, not really something that was the, the first thing. This seems like an afterthought on Fantex side. Front I.O. is mostly what we'd hope for from a case this large and functional looking. Four USB 3 Type A ports, one USB 3.2 Type C port, and finally we get a case that includes a USB C port without eliminating half of the Type A ports. There are also separate buttons for LED color, LED mode, and reset without resorting to the usual method of repurposing the reset button into an LED control button. Fantax has clearly made a point of having a full suite of I.O. ports, which makes it odd that the audio jack is actually a single combined headphone and mic jack. Using any of the front I.O. other than the power button does require opening the plastic door on the front of the case, though, so users will probably prefer rear panel audio jacks for long time usage. The side panel attachment is simplistic, which is one area where Fantex could have added some value. Both side panels slide on and detach with two captive thumb screws at the back. It's fine, but it's less expensive of a combination than the hinged doors of the P500A, as an example. The extremely large steel side panel is prone to warping, which is the reason that the cable cover is required. Any unmanaged cables have the potential to bow out the side panel. At a glance, the ventilation holes cut into this steel panel appear to be less restrictive than the pattern that's cut into the O11XL side panel. The front panel is obviously a major focus of Fantex marketing here. Even at CES, they had a special setup for it for showing how high airflow it truly is. And uh, Fantex calls this, it's, it's got a marketing word for it, high performance fabric, all camel case. That's how you know that it's important. And despite having a special name, this is basically just an extremely wide spacing mesh, in air quotes there. So Fantax is trying to produce something that is more breathable than maybe the P500A, the P400A, and so forth. But at the same time, there is a reason that not everybody has ascended to open air test benches like we have here. And some people do still use cases. That reason, dust, obviously. So those fine mesh panels, NR600, P500A, those will still stop a lot of dust. This, we haven't had it long enough to really put to the test, but clearly by looking at it, it's not gonna stop quite as much. So while Fantex high performance mesh may be more breathable, so too is a giant hole in the front of the case. And this isn't far from it because there's ultimately still a dust filter seated behind it. And in Fantax marketing materials, the company even says the dust filter behind the N2 Pro 2 front panel can be removed for maximum airflow performance. At that point, it is really just that what they're saying is that this is enough to stop some larger dust particles, but it, it really is just marketing at that point because it's not doing much for you if you remove the dust filter and run this. We'll have performance numbers in a moment to show you how the fabric does perform with and without the dust filter in there. In terms of potential concerns, normally with this type of material, you're thinking more about long-term, about potential for sag getting pulled inward by the fans over time, which has happened with, say, some of the Corsair 220Ts. This one is, it does have some reinforcing structure plastic behind it to help hold it in place. And it is pulled pretty taut. So they've at least thought ahead to try and prevent both of those issues. If they'll become issues, that's obviously an endurance thing. We can't test that in the turnaround time of review, but it's not gonna get sucked into the fans. As for whether it'll sag, we'll see with time. The top filter is just a generic rectangle of mesh with magnetic borders, but the front and bottom filters have more thought put into them. The front filter intentionally has some thickness to keep it out of contact with the front fans. 
and the border has been carefully shaped to avoid holes on the chassis. There's also a tiny handle at the top to help pop the filter out. It's not groundbreaking, but it's good to see effort being invested here when another generic filter would have worked just as well. The fan mounting rails support both 120mm and 140mm fans, but the 120mm mounts have been shaped to obstruct 140mm fans as little as possible while remaining structurally sound. Removing either the bottom filter or the front filter requires entirely removing the front panel, which unfortunately doesn't use the ball and cup snaps that we've seen in other Fantex cases, but is the entire length of the case, and it removes from the front. Since there's no way for the power supply to draw air from the bottom of the case, this filter exists to support bottom-mounted fans and radiators. For bottom-mounted intake fans, there's just under 3.5 centimeters of distance from the surface the case stands on to the floor of the case with a few extra millimeters of clearance added by the removable fan and radiator tray. It's a good tray, held in by a single captive thumb screw, which is torqued down so hard that it warped the bottom of the case. The O11XL has a similar amount of clearance, although the plastic trim along the bottom edge of the Enthu Pro 2 makes it appear to be much less. Interference from the power splash route means that the tray can only fit a single 140mm fan and there's no room to spare on either side of 120mm fans. The section of the tray adjacent to the power splash shroud won't fit anything wider than 125mm at the very most. Thermals are up next, but since our thermal task bench uses air cooling and the Enthu Pro 2 clearly is competing with the O11XL for the large liquid-focused case market, let's take a moment and compare them on those terms. The Enthu Pro 2 makes much of its fan support, allegedly fitting up to 15 120mm fans, or eight 140mm fans, but the radiator support is what really matters here. The Fantex case has an unobstructed 480mm front radiator mount, as well as 480mm for the side mount, but they can't be used at the same time. There's enough room to fit a radiator and fans on one mount and fans on the other, for example, but two radiators side by side will not fit. There is actually enough space for a full 480mm radiator, including the tanks at the top and the bottom. There's not much reason to use the side mount in the Pro 2, in our opinion, since the front mount will work better for anything less than 480mm long. The O11XL lacks a front mount and supports a maximum of 360mm on its side mount. We consider top mounting in Lian Li's case superior, since the entire thickness of a radiator with fans installed can fit above the top edge of the motherboard, and both cases are tied at 360mm max for this location. At the bottom of the case, the O11XL can support two 80mm or 360mm radiators, while the Pro 2 can only support up to 360mm radiators since the mount is too narrow for multiple 140mm fans. Using a max length radiator in the bottom of the Pro 2 also has potential to conflict with the max length front mounted radiators or side mounted radiators with tubes at the bottom. While the O11XL's greater width allows side mounted radiators to be positioned well clear of the bottom mount. The N2 Pro 2 is the winner in terms of maximum individual radiator size, but the O11XL can squeeze in three 360mm radiators simultaneously. Both cases have strengths, but overall it just comes down to quantity versus the max individual size. Related points in the Pro 2's favor are a drain port at the bottom of the front panel and the potential for using the side fan mount to attach a reservoir while using the front mount for a radiator. For our thermal tests, we decided to focus on the front panel that Fantex is so proud of. Since there were no fans included in the case though, we used three of Fantex's own 140mm SK series PWM fans as front intake for baseline testing. We consider that a normal starting point for the target audience of this case, and again, we recognize that most users will install some form of liquid in the case. So we're primarily comparing the case against itself to test the front panel and the various airflow configurations. After all, even with liquid cooling, you still use air, and air still flows the same way. Our original stock result for the CPU torture test was 46 degrees Celsius above ambient with the case fans at 100% speed. But, as we explained, we decided to use the noise normalized result as our baseline for testing, with those fans reduced to 45% speed. We'll discuss noise normalized testing in a chart later on on its own, but the average in that test was 52 degrees. Removing the front filter reduced that delta to 49 degrees, and removing both the front panel and the filter resulted in an average of 47 degrees. We can deduce a few things from these results. The high airflow fabric does obstruct airflow a little bit, but not as much as the actual filter. But the front panel and the filter combined don't hurt thermals much more than the P400A's mesh panel does. 
So this is a promising start. But one more important point here, remember that the static pressure performance of the fans will entirely dictate the numbers you see here. In this instance, with the hindered fan speed, we end up with a scenario that is a worst, but not worst case scenario for the N2 Pro 2. Sticking three fans in the Pro 2 isn't stock, so we won't spend too much time comparing it to the past stock cases on our chart. The 46 degree delta we measured with 100% fan speed would tie the Pro 2 with the H500M mesh as one of the best cooled cases on the chart so far, while the 52 degree delta with reduced fan speed places it at about the performance level of the TD500 mesh. The O11XL averaged 54 degrees using our standardized set of fans in this test, but that's with the intake fans positioned at the bottom of the case, far away from the CPU cooler. Another test had it closer to 50C, while some of the other unshown feature tests were closer to 48. The noise normalized and standardized fan tests coming up in a moment are better for comparative testing, so keep watching for that. The GPU temperature with 100% case fan speed averaged 44 degrees Celsius over ambient, and lowering fan speed to 45% only raised that delta to 47 degrees. Remember again that for our what we're calling stock configuration here, it's the three Fantax 140mm fans that we installed only in the front and then we used the noise normalized setup for the other featured tests. Removing just the filter lowered it to 46 degrees, and removing both the filter and the front panel lowered it further to 45 degrees. We rarely have numbers that line up this neatly. A difference of only 2 degrees between having the front panel and the filter on versus taking them off completely is an achievement, and it appears that the front panel really might be as breathable as advertised. Keep in mind that this is dependent on, again, static pressure performance, so it'll change as you change the fans. But, if anything, this indicates that Fantex doesn't need to include the line about taking the filter out, since its impact on thermals is minimal. Glancing quickly at our chart of stock case results for the GPU, an average of 44 degrees would make the Pro 2 the best performing case on the chart currently plotted, while an average of 47 degrees would tie it with the RL06 and the half X, with only the SL600M significantly past it at 45 degrees. Compare that with the O11 Dynamic with the three intake side fans at 100%, which averaged 48 degrees, or the O11 XL with a standardized set of Noctua fans pointed directly into the GPU cooler at 47 degrees, and we get something of an idea of how it performs relatively, and it's well. For standardized fan testing, we use the same kit of Noctua fans we always do, in the same configuration two 140mm front intake, and one 120mm rear exhaust. We chose the upper two slots for intake fans. The average CPU temperature as a result of that was 49 degrees Celsius over ambient, and that was the first instance where we've seen the Pro 2's thermal performance falter. Taking one look at this fan arrangement makes the problem pretty obvious. Even though these 140mm fans would take up most of the front panel in a mid-tower, as we've shown before, they only cover a fraction of the cavernous interior of the Pro 2 and they're far away from the CPU cooler. That said, performance isn't that far behind the 46 degree baseline result, and it's good to average relative to the rest of the standardized fan chart. The glass-fronted Corsair 465 RGB is tied at 49C, the O11 XL is actually several degrees warmer at 54C, thanks to the bottom intake layout that we had to use in that case, and if you're going with an air cooler in this case, you'll want either top intake or fans that can push a real tunnel of air straight into the CPU cooler. In contrast, average GPU temperature was 45 degrees Celsius above ambient, tied for the best result we've seen so far in this test. While the CPU suffered mildly from the wide open space, preventing a strong funneled front-to-back airflow pattern with just two front intakes, the GPU benefited from the huge empty chamber below it. This average is one degree warmer than baseline but it's still even better than the O11 XL's average of 47 degrees, even though it had direct active GPU cooling in this test. This advantage will diminish if the space at the bottom of the Pro 2 is used for anything, especially a secondary system, but between the size of the interior, the mesh front panel, and the bottom intake slots, the potential for GPU cooling in this case is undeniably strong. We can't reasonably measure the noise level of this case when it depends entirely on which fans the user installs. Noise and normalized testing is still fair game, though. The Fantax 140mm fans were used for baseline and were pretty loud at 1500 RPM, and hitting the 36 dBA threshold we've set for noise normalized testing required setting them to 45% speed in BIOS. That's approximately 900 RPM here, with the rest of the fans left as they are normally. Having all of the fans installed in the front of the case is a disadvantage for noise but it's the same layout that other Fantax airflow cases use, and they still manage to score well. The CPU temperature averaged 52 degrees Celsius above ambient at this speed, 
right in line with the other mesh fronted cases that we've tested. The P500 and 400A were a little cooler at 50 and 51 respectively, while the 500DX tied at 52. Average GPU temperature for this test was 47 degrees Celsius above ambient, impressively close to the 44 degree result at 100% RPM given how drastically reduced the fan speed was. Again, GPU thermals are a strong point of this case, especially without anything installed in the lower half. Relative to other noise normalized case tests, the Pro 2 is tied with the O11XL for best overall, both of them a significant step beyond the runner-up P500A's average of 50 degrees Celsius above ambient. We used the standardized Noctua set of fans for this test in the O11XL, so it might have a slight disadvantage compared to the three 140mm fans we chose for the Pro 2. But keep in mind that the intake fans in the O11XL were positioned directly below the GPU and pointed into the cooler. The fact that the Pro 2 has tied it with front to back airflow patterns under any circumstance is impressive. Closing out then a couple of things. First of all, we haven't actually talked about the looks at all at this point. And on the looks side, we don't go into too much detail on this normally, but this is absolutely not trying to do anything stylized. Kind of like the Corsair Obsidian case, it, it does kind of look a bit like an appliance, and that's fine. Some people want that. It looks a little bit less like an appliance than the Corsair 1000D, which is basically uh, like a refrigerator or something, at its size and its appearance. But it is still, nonetheless, a rather plain rectangular black box. Uh, the Anodiz AI Crystal, for example, would kind of fall into this same category. So that's going to be hit and miss for some people. As far as the case itself, the N2 Pro 2 is absolutely not something you should buy if you're going to be building any sort of mid-tower type of system. Anything that's suitable in a P400A, P500A from Fantax or from competitors, there's plenty of options. O11 uh, non-XL, the Dynamic, you can look at the Be Quiet, uh, 500DX, plenty of cases like that we've reviewed recently in our Best Airflow Cases Roundup just a couple days ago even. So you can find all that out there if you want to see it. But uh, if you're building something that is going to be more air cooling focused or you're just not going to make use of the massive chambers in this case, you end up with something that looks kind of comical. And our test system is standardized. We use it for everything. Ultimately, airflow is still airflow. It's still going to move the same way. So for purposes of testing airflow patterns and layout and performance comparatively, it still works for that. But in a practical sense, we wouldn't build that system in this. It's, it's not really suitable for it, and we know that. So if you're buying this case, you really should be doing some kind of custom loop, or if not, committing too much to that, at least considering maybe a dual system build, which we couldn't even uh, fully explore because it didn't ship with any accessories because they were not put back in the box or something. Uh, or you should be at least doing something with closed loop liquid coolers. But uh, otherwise, the thing just ends up empty and, and kind of awkward. So it's not meant for smaller systems. That much should be clear. At $140, it is a, a very uh, aggressive competitor in terms of economics versus some of the competition in the market now. The O11XL, significantly more expensive. We liked that case a lot. We built our production system in it with a full open loop, but this would be a direct competitor to it. And it's cheaper. So it's about 60 bucks cheaper if you buy the glass paneled version. The biggest trade-offs between this and the O11XL, other than looks, would be some of the layout formatting where the XL pushes things into a separate compartment. You've got some interesting choices for hot swap bays if you buy the extra things like the back plane for the drives. And then also interesting options for radiators where this one versus the O11XL, it's a trade-off of maximum uh, single radiator size. So in the front on this thing, you can fit uh, a larger 480 mil radiator. And on the O11XL, the size caps out smaller, as we talked about earlier. So that's consideration. But you can fit more radiators in the O11XL. So that's your trade-off. The case overall, build quality, we think it's fine uh, thermally. It's kind of like whatever because it, it does well in some of the tests. It does average in some of the others. Ultimately, that's less of a factor of the case at this point and more of a factor of the system setup. So if, it's, if it doesn't have that static pressure performance, the air is just, it'll disperse or you'll lose pressure or it'll end up getting drafted out the top because there's this massive chasm between the front fan and where the tower will be. So you're going to have a lot of air getting just slowly drafted out of the top just from natural pressure systems. If you have exhaust fans up there, you're going to steal air from it. So just be careful with how you set it up. But build quality seems good overall. That's it for this one. Thanks for watching. Subscribe for more. Go to store.gamersnexus.net to help us out directly or patreon.com slash gamersnexus. 
And uh, one last thing, Fantax gave us about 24 to 36 hours to finish this review with the arrival of the case. So this is the best we could do in that time. Thanks for watching. We'll see you all next time.